Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining my talk. Uh, I really appreciate it, especially giving up your break to be here. And uh, what a talk to follow. Uh, but uh, in this talk, I'm, I'll concentrate on one of the principles that they pointed out, which is discovery, uh, discovery problem. Uh, so I'm joining you from IPNI Foundation. It's a cell in Open Impact Foundation. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the system that we've been building and maintaining as an open uh, public good service for about three years now. And I feel privileged because I've been there from its inception on early days. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's close to my heart. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the discovery problem. The discovery problem without re-enabling another Google Analytics. The discovery problem while enabling application builders like you. And talk a little bit about how IPNI approaches this whole problem. So how much data is out there? Do you have any idea? Anyone? I'll tell you. So it's about 181 zettabytes of data out there-ish, right? Uh, and that is 181 with 21 zeros. I had to count it twice just to make sure. Yeah, so that's, that's a lot of data. I, I want you to keep that number in mind. Uh, and this is what the internet looks like. It is fantastic. Everything is connected or talking to each other, beautiful. And everybody connects to the internet, goes to their virtual space, talks about stuff, and you know, they could be in different places, and all the fantastic things that are happening, it all great, it's all great. This is not the internet, guys. This is not the internet today at all. What the internet actually looks like is a bit like this one, right? I specifically relate to the guy with the blue hat, I don't know why, but that's what the internet usage looks like today. Let me walk you through why I think this. As soon as we connect to the internet, we go and pay our taxes to kingdoms of internet, which are Googles, Microsofts, Apples, and so on. We go and just, we have to pay our taxes to use the services. As soon as we uh, set foot on the internet, we are in someone's territory, right? Then what happens is we give them their data and they mine it for us dictating how we can use it, and they capitalize on top of it. And I just love the, love the way that in olden days they could really depict misery. Right? Look at the faces, right? <laughs> it gets worse. It is way worse than this, actually. Because then what happens is we are told what our data was without verifying it at all. We upload our data. We don't verify it at all today. We just log back in and we expect to get what we put back into the server without zero, zero verification, right? This, you know what this is? This is internet in middle, age, middle ages. We are modern, we're living in 2024, right? But our internet experience is stuck in middle ages. We are still uh, farmers in someone's kingdom. We have no control over our own destiny. Uh, and, you know, I think this is a fitting, really fitting uh, terminology borrowed by people way smarter than me, but it makes perfect sense to me. We just need way more hashes to make the internet better, right? A lot more hashes. We do not want to just take data as, we, as, we, as is presented to us. We want to have some way to be able to verify hashes. And this, is, this goes back to what Juan mentioned in the opening talk, which is concentration on increasing the amount of CIDs out there. Because CID is the thinnest waste we can think of in terms of verifying the data that we're getting back, right? But it's not so bad, right? We have, we have a few hashes back out there. Uh, now what, right? We've got some hashes. Now what? We've got a hash. We've got a CID. And this is what the IPFS routing looks like. We take a CID, completely unreadable by human, pretty much. And what happens is we, we ask an IPFS node, and an IPFS node talks to other nodes, and other nodes talk to BitSwap, and a lot of uh, things happen, and we eventually find the answer, right? But the actual internet is heterogeneous. There is a lot of different nodes. For example, there are mobile devices, there are servers with a lot of computation, there are uh, poorly connected laptops with a lot of computation, but low bandwidth, you, you name it. I mean, there's, it's just a variety of lots of different things on the internet, right? So the routing has to adapt to that to be able to tolerate um, 
differentiation in the services, but also uh, optimize for best quality of service for its users. Remember the 21 zeros that I talked to you about earlier? Uh, 181, 21 zeros at the end of it, 10 to the 21. It's actually called sextillion, and I had to look that up. I thought that was tasteful. So uh, if, you wanted to, if you wanted to count the number of SIDs that it takes for the data out there, right? Uh, we divide 181 uh, sextillion by 32-ish, and we get just above five sextillion CIDs, right? And if I wanted to draw the arrows for these five sextillion CIDs out in the world, this slide would look a bit like this. It would be completely white with arrows many, many times over. I want to give you some visualization of how many CIDs are out there or we are owed to the world, if you think of it that way, in order to make our data traceable, right? If you have that many CIDs, it is very difficult to route data. The traditional DHGs would not work very well. You need to rethink the routing system, right? So let's just panic, right? It's, it's really difficult to build this. Let's just give up and go home. It's an extremely difficult problem, right? Uh, we have been gripped with this problem for a while, uh, at least in, in my circle of research and work. And uh, I can tell you that it is very easy to reinvent a Google Analytics or enable another Google Analytics. Because immediately when you uh, face a problem that requires a huge amount of data, requires a massive lookup table, that's not going to fit on anybody's machine, and it, and it has to be fast, you know, these two things happen together, then you're absolutely thinking, okay, there's only, the, on, the only way to do this is just, let's stick it to the server. This is why centralization exists. Let's just do that, right? And that's where the, uh, the kingdoms start. So in my humble opinion, uh, we should be very careful in enabling another kingdom while we're solving fundamental problems, right? So that's the challenge. How did we approach it as an IPNI team? Uh, we are going, we want to make servers dumb again. That's exactly what we want to do. So the fine line that we are walking here is we want to keep the system decentralized. We want to use centralization in a fitting way, but make the servers dumb again. The so-called uh, smart devices out there, they are nothing but a client to a terminal today, even though they have uh, hundreds of thousands of times more computational power than the servers that powered uh, early versions of internet. Think about that for a second, right? So the internet that I want to build and I envision would have dumb servers, federated auxiliary of services, right, that cannot infer anything about the information that goes out there while keeping the mobile devices or the devices that we own physically sovereign such that they should be able to function without having to depend on any other server, but they could depend on the servers for better quality of service. That's the trade-off that I'm making. Enter IPNI. IPNI is, uh, started out actually as a centralized system. Uh, it is built from ground up to ingest um, uh, CIDs by the billion. So to this, uh, right now, today, it is ingesting four billion CIDs uh, as we speak. Uh, even though the you know, usage of uh, C contact itself has gone through up and downs a lot. Uh, for example, six months ago, we were ingesting over 20 billion hashes per day. And it took a lot of optimizations for us to get there. There is a cluster of um, key value stores in the back that are chained together that allow you to look things up within a few milliseconds, but to be concise by the time that the response is returned, it is, you know, to, to the 90th percentile, it takes about 30 milliseconds or so. Um, it is designed to be a sovereign, composable fabric of routing in the future internet. Uh, I'll, talk to, uh, I'll talk about that a bit in a minute. It is deeply integrated into Kubo as one of the default routing systems. It exists in Lotus, the most popular uh, Filecoin integration, uh, Boost. It is the de facto default built-in routing mechanism in Lassie. Uh, remember what I told you about keeping the servers dumb? Well, IPNI uses this technique called um, double hashing, which was in collaboration with the IPFS uh, shipyard team, previously Stuart's key sitting over there. Uh, it is built such that the server cannot infer what CID you're looking for. So all the records in the, in the key value store are encrypted. 
Uh, it is integrated with delegated routing, which makes the systems composable. Uh, this is the standards that uh, uh, Lidl talked about uh, earlier today. Uh, it allows you to just look things up, speak the same language, and it would just work. You as a user do not care about where the answer comes from as long as the answer is correct and verifiable. Uh, and uh, we were extremely lucky to be voted at the top 15% of uh, projects with impact in Filecoin RetroPGF. Uh, internally, IPNI uses uh, a, uh, to me this is interesting, but you tell me otherwise, uh, there is a uh, QR code that explains the uh, specification in full, but it, you can think of IPNI as a series of blockchains. Every provider in IPNI has its own blockchain. And the blockchain that I have is just a chain of advertisements. I have this, I added these CIDs, actually I deleted these, now I'm going to change the, my transport protocol to be HTTP, oh no, forget it, I'm going to use uh, GraphSync. This chain just continues. And this chain is just your chain, right? I don't control it, you fully control that chain. And then what happens is, there's a server that goes around and reads all these chains, mirrors it for optimization reasons, and just ingests it. So as long as indexers are kept reasonably up to date, catching up to new data is very quick, right? And um, more importantly, anybody can verify your chain. So anybody in the internet can go and uh, literally access your chain and make sure you're saying, uh, you did say that you had a CID, right? So there's some degree of uh, verifiability built into it. And then in the back end, you're basically using a very simple double um, external, uh, what is it? Uh, a, a double um, a reference key between two columnar key value stores, if you like, to store the information, which is uh, from a multi-hash, we can go to a, uh, this thing we call a value key, which has reference to many, many providers. So let's go back to this lookup thing that I talked about earlier. If you want to think about it, where the servers are absolutely dumb and they just work an auxiliary, as an auxiliary service, this is what the lookup looks like to me. You have a CID that, that you can look up. Without IPNI, the whole system is sovereign and must and should and is functioning using um, uh, Amino DHT and other uh, lookup services in the, on the internet. Anybody in this room could start their own IPNI server. I don't control it. There's actually no permissions at all. As soon as you start publishing, the, the indexers having, uh, if they choose to, they can ingest your information and make it available. And for performance reasons, if a user wants to get the data fast, they could just go into one of these IPNI uh, endpoints and uh, find the data much, much faster along with extra information and so on, right? So system works better with it. System, system is sovereign without it. That's my definition of keeping the services and servers dumb. Seed.contact is now has been running for over three years as a totally public good service. Uh, it, it is, as I mentioned, ingesting about four, billions, uh, four billion hashes per day. Uh, that screenshot was taken from the HTTP server yesterday. We are serving about 50,000 requests per minute. Uh, so, you know, we're grateful for anybody, all, all of you that are using Seed.contact. Uh, like I mentioned, the lookup time uh, in 90th percentile falls just under 30 milliseconds or so, which we are pretty happy about considering the amount of information that we have stored. So we're talking about six different clusters, each of which have 16 terabytes of data, and there are, you know, about five of them are almost fully utilized. So that's a lot of key values. Uh, we have four, uh, three federated instances. So we are just working on a federation protocol. Uh, that is a link to the Federation Protocol specification. Uh, I would love your comments and feedbacks on it. Uh, please go and have a look. Uh, we have uh, the, feather the uh, specification itself is defined. There is a, a basic implementation of it uh, that's running across three instances. Uh, so we are just in the process of basically moving uh, all our infrastructure into bare metal instances that are currently deployed in San Francisco and one in Berlin. Uh, and we're just experimenting with uh, federation instances. So now is the time to join us if you'd like to run one of these instances. We have got the operations down. So these, these nodes, even though they deliver really high performance, they're uh, relatively extremely cheap to run. Um, it took a lot of optimization, so please come talk to us. Um, one quick slide on the IPNI Foundation. So this is an open foundation. Uh, we, are, we are working on an open system. We have, uh, we have established mechanisms by which you can contribute on the 
specification level, on the implementation level, and we are dedicated in providing um, a lookup mechanism that is composable, but also a lookup mechanism that uh, has open specification and uh, remains open, because uh, I think it is extremely important to keep that open, otherwise that is the gateway where you enable uh, many, many kingdoms of Web3, right? And if we are in the business of making a decentralized web, having a front runner in decentralized web means we probably got it wrong, right? Any one of us could be able to be a front runner, right? So it is, it is important to think about that a little bit and think very carefully about uh, do I really want to roll out a totally new service and like, you know, basically take over the world sort of situation. Instead, we should be contributing to open protocols and, uh, you know, helping each other succeed, basically. Uh, on the roadmap, uh, we are, we, I talked about federation network, so uh, we are working to expand and expand the federation network. Please come talk to us if you're interested in running one. Uh, we are working on ambient discovery uh, with the IPFS shipyard team, and that is a mechanism by which IPFS nodes could uh, discover other indexes based on just ambient traffic. Uh, that way, if you have many, many indexes deployed across the planet, they would just find each other, talk, each other, talk to each other, and there's some basic local uh, reputation system that picks the best instance for you depending on uh, historical results and so on. But that is being solidified, but we, we hope that it will roll out and it fits really well into the uh, federation story. Uh, there's been efforts in creating a naming system or new versions of IPNS that works on top of IPNI. Um, again, uh, same thing, you can use the existing IPNS system or it should just work just like the way that content routing works using IPNI uh, systems because at the end of the day we're talking about a key value store which should be uh, enough to implement a naming system. And last but not least, we are interested in working with a community to implement a direct puts, uh, support direct puts. And that basically brings you into a world where you can um, implement interactions that you have already with Amino DHT, where you explicitly can put information uh, that expires, but you can do it with IPNI. And once that is enabled, then there is nothing left, I think, I think there's nothing left to take IPNI and make an IPFS compatible implementation that uses IPNI law, right? So you can imagine where, where I see this, these things going and fitting together where what we have is an IPFS specification or minimum requirements that are implementable by many, many ways. Those implementations are sovereign. They could work on their own based on services that we all run, you know, in ambient noise, but they're also sovereign in, uh, in such a way that they could uh, talk to dumb servers to improve uh, quality of service for users. Uh, please get involved. These are, this is where we, you can find us. There is a GitHub org, uh, IPNI, and the specifications. Uh, please just go on, open a PR, whatever you like. Uh, we would love to hear from you in terms of uh, things that are interesting to work on from IPNI team's perspective. There's actually currently a uh, poll going on in IPNI channel uh, in Filecoin Slack, which you can find the link there. Uh, please go and vote for your best, most desired improvement, and we're going to take those votes and take it further. Thank you so much for listening to me. Sure.